Hello, lovely friend. I am Dr. Mary Barson. And I'm Dr. Lucy Burns. And this is The The Real Real Health and and Weight Loss Podcast. Hello, lovely friend. Dr. Mary here. And I am joined by the fabulous, wonderful, amazing Dr. Lucy. Lovely Lucy, how are you today? I am awesome, Mez. Thank you for that little intro. If I ever need a boost, I'll just kind of ring you up and go, can you introduce me? <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> anytime, I know. Ah, oh, lovely. I wanted to tell you a little story um, about <laughs> goats. things that have been on my mind. Goats, yes. So there's three goat things that I want to chat to you about. One is that I actually have a goat. Her name is Saffron and she lives out in the paddock. She's the cutest thing. and We've had her since she was a bubba and she's really like a dog. So you toddle out to the paddock and she comes barring up to you and then if you sit down, she'll hop on your knee and really she just super loves pats. She, she's, she's a good goat. And we were in the last round of the 12-week mind-body rebalance in our coaching call Coaching calls are fun. God, I love them. They are so fun. fun. We were having a hoot, having a laugh. And I said to uh, the peeps, oh, you guys are the goats. And there was all this people going, what, what, what are you talking about? And I realised that not everyone (laughs) knew what a goat was. And I'm going, oh, and of course the Olympics had just been on. So I'm going, oh, goats, the greatest of all time. And I was saying, you guys are the greatest of all time. I was telling a story about how I'd called my daughter a goat because she'd brought me in a cup of tea and apparently that's very uncool. So don't do that if you're hanging out with Jen. No, you have to that. embarrass your parents, otherwise you're not parent. You have to embarrass your children, otherwise you're not parenting right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So then I was saying to them that, you know, if you guys are the goats and I must be a goat herder. And, uh, yes, we all had a big laugh. And then <laughs> the next day one of our um, beautiful Participants then put a picture of a whole heap of goats in the Facebook group and so then this just became this little thing, which is an interesting juxtaposition to my third goat, which is something I spend a fair bit of time, which is getting on my goat. It has been a favourite saying of mine that really gets on my goat. I don't know where that comes from, but honestly, the thing that is getting on my goat at the moment is uh, influencers still talking about calories. And that there are people out there with huge followings. So massive ability to influence people giving incorrect information. And that that gets on my goat. It honestly does. It, calories has become something that um, I think that we, it's, it's just been absorbed into our culture. Everybody believes in calories, like children believe in the tooth fairy. And I think mm. that it has done us a great disservice because it's, let's unpack now why the concept of calories in food, calorie counting, calorie restriction, why it's inaccurate, why it's unhelpful, and what are much better ways to approach health and wellness. And I think I just, I just have to, mm. the scientist in me just has to say this, that we don't, we don't even really question what a calorie is, but it's a fascinating mm. story as to how we came to think about foods and how we nourish our body in calories. It's a fairly modern concept, uh, only been around, really took hold, you know, since the 1960s, 1970s, but the concept of calories is, is, is just over 100 years old. And, but what it actually is, it's just a unit of measure And it's the amount of energy required to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that's it. That's just what a calorie is. And it seems Mm. like a really abstract and unhelpful thing to think about with the food that we eat. (laughs) And it actually turns out that it is, except that's not how human history has played out. And so just expand a little bit more about, about, you know, calories in food and why everybody cares and perhaps why they shouldn't. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, we've been sold this story and, and on, on its surface it sounds, sounds reasonable that if you eat fewer calories, so you consume fewer calories than you expend or burn, as the favourite phrase seems to be, then you will lose weight. That's the sort of summary of it. 
And, you know, at some level it sounds reasonable, a bit like, you know, if you want to become wealthy, you have to spend less money than you, um, than you save. But there's a whole heap of stuff, I mean, you know, and again, this is, not a, this is not a wealth creation podcast, but we know that for people who want to create wealth, it's, it's not that simple. You know, it's, there's a whole heap of other things, you know, that look at that. You look at bank fees, you look at investments and you look at interest and all of those are the things that determine ultimately your wealth. And it's a little bit like calories. Hmm. It sounds so simple, but there's a whole heap of things that, at play, the first of which is that unlike dollars, which are just a dollar, although I guess maybe we've got world currencies, so there is some difference, mm-hmm. but a calorie in food, it's not even accurate. No, not the so way that we're told. It's not accurate. No. No. So, and the other thing that I think is really interesting is that it's the only thing that we, like if calories are the only thing that we sort of refer to, particularly that phrase calorie deficit, which is another big thing that gets on my goat. If we, if we wanted to use, so, so calories are a measure of energy, so a unit of energy. If we're talking about heating a room, we would talk about degrees, whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. So you talk about degrees. If you want to cool the room, Nobody says, oh, I need to cool my room down. I'm just going to be in a degrees deficit. <laughs> like people would look at not... you like, what? Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm just going to be in a degrees deficit and that'll cool the room down. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and if we then move that analogy even a bit further on how that would look, well, then you would turn the heater down. So that's like having less calories. But then you could also open the windows You might look at the um, insulation in your roof. You might think about uh, whether you've got a thermogenic mass in your floor. And all of those will determine how fast you cool your room down. Yes. Or how fast your your temperature deficit becomes effective. Sorry, not your temperature deficit, your degrees deficit. Degrees deficit, yes, that's right. And we never use that, you know. D- turn it up, uh, you know. Yeah, I want I, I want a hertz surplus of that of that noise. It's not what we <laughs> say at all. But that no, idea of also we don't being use a, this. You know, we don't. We don't. A calorie deficit. No. Since calories are a unit of energy, then we could say you know, an, mm. an energy deficit, a kilojoule deficit. And and actually, human bodies are never in an energy deficit whilst we are living. We're not. The, the, no. whole, the definition of being alive is that we trans. Well, one of the definitions of being alive is that we transform energy from one form into another. That's what alive things do, so that we can create all of those processes within the cell. The biochemical processes can keep going. That requires energy, and our beautiful, mm. amazing, clever bodies will just will burn the energy that they need and they will burn the energy from food that we eat and they will burn the energy from energy that is stored and mm. that is always happening. So there is never any energy deficit. There's no actual calorie deficit. But what is going on is that our bodies will access fuel from different places, from mm. our food, from our fat, from our protein, from, you know, in cases of extreme starvation, from, you know, our gut lining. But, and what mm. we can do is create a beautiful, nourishing environment internally for ourselves where it's easy for our bodies to access our stored fat as an energy source because mm. that is what it's there for and our bodies Indeed. are happy and healthy when we're able to burn that. But a great way to get yourself into that state where you can easily burn your stored body fat is by not counting calories. Indeed. Indeed. And... I mean, the extremely flawed, the extreme, I mean, it blows my mind. I can barely speak. But the the extreme thing that people are missing here is that if your insulin levels are high, and let's face it, the majority of the world, particularly if you're over 50, but not necessarily so, if you are storing excess fat around your middle, then you are insulin resistant. And Mm. if you are insulin resistant, you cannot access your stored fuel. So it doesn't matter 
about this so-called calorie deficit because you can't get it. And then what Mm. happens? You're tired, you're hungry, you can't think, you're not functioning, you feel terrible. And so what do you do? You go and eat and then you berate yourself for having no willpower. And the way I like to think about it is that if you're insulin resistant, it's like you're a, a truck. Let's say you're a truck that carries fuel. So you're a fuel tanker and you'll have petrol or diesel. They probably have diesel in their, in their fuel tank and that'll take them so far. But you've also got this ginormous tanker on your back that's full of, of diesel. That's like the stored body fat. Indeed. So that's just stored body fat. And so as you're running out of fuel, you can't actually go and just get some fuel out of the tank. You have to go to the petrol station and you have to go and, you know, get it from the service station. And so it's really interesting then that this idea that we can just tap into the fuel stores because we're in a calorie deficit, except they're not considering insulin levels. Mm. And it's, I mean, it was interesting earlier on, Mez, you said that the um, the calorie counting, which was done, which was created by this dude called Antwater, was done, you know, mm. it's fairly modern, although I would argue it's also fairly archaic because well, so he discovered 120 years ago, whatever it was, mm. but we also know that only 30 years ago we discovered more metabolic hormones. Yes. I guess what I meant is that animals have, are thriving all over the world uh, without ever mm. really bothering to count calories. So Indeed. It's like a little, from, from that point of view, it's a modern imposition that yes. we humans have placed upon ourselves. But you were right. From a scientific knowledge and understanding point of view of how human metabolism works, it is extremely archaic. Mm. Uh, this idea that we are simple buckets of calories is is very very archaic and 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 not in keeping with our current scientific understanding you know which shows that we are really complex biological organisms and we've got complex um, hormonal interplays that control our hunger satiety our intake of food and our use of fuel and which fuel we fuels that we can use whether it is you know the fuel in our tank or the fuel that's you know, um, in a big storage container on top of us, uh, or to use our woodshed analogy, whether it's mm. the the carb kindling that's there by the fireplace, or whether it is the stored, um, you know, logs of fat that are locked away in mm. our woodshed, and insulin is the lock. It's really complex, mm. and it's it's so complex that reducing it to a simple argument of calories is not very helpful. But let's let's just imagine for a moment that even if you did believe, like you truly believed in, you know, the caloric impact of food and you're like, no, nah, it's all about calories, maybe yes. we could just, just discuss, just debunk for a minute why mm. even if you believe in that rather flawed concept, even then calorie counting isn't helpful because there is so much variation and inaccuracies about how calories are measured Mm. On and how and um and what is on the food label um, compared to um the different energy that is required to absorb the certain nutrients. There's different variations in humans in how they absorb food. There's variations in our gut microbiome. So some different people with different gut microbiomes will absorb more energy or less energy. And there is also a role of our immune system. Mm. Lots of these individual factors make you know, the little label on the box, really inaccurate. And Lucy, you were telling me as well about like mm. how the labeling's worked out. Yeah. So I think there's two things to think about. So, I mean, you know, I, I like to stalk a lot of Facebook groups just to see, you know, what the general public are thinking about, what's their, what, are their, what, what are their pain points, what are their issues. And so many times I see people going, ah, oh, I'm, I'm in a calorie deficit, I'm only eating 100 and 1200 calories a day but I'm not losing any weight why not what's wrong and they think that there's they're doing something wrong so the first thing is to unpack the word uh, unpack the food labeling system so the way we cut um, the way food labeling calculates calories per serve is based on the calories decided by this ant ant water guy 100 years ago that fat, one gram of fat 
contains nine calories of energy and one gram of protein contains four calories of energy and one gram of carbohydrates also contains four. It's sort of, it's 3.9, but everyone rounds it up. And so they will then look at the, what's in their food and then go, oh, well, you know, our food has 20% carbohydrates, you know, 50% fat and 30% protein or whatever it is. It's usually the other way around. And, um, and therefore that's how we add up the calories and therefore you've got, that, that's your calories. And people who are calorie counting are counting down to the last calorie that the accuracy of these, except fun fact, they only have to be, there's a, they're, they're allowed a 20% fudge factor. So the calorie, I mean, so <laughs> even if you wanted to count calories and you're there diligently tracking every thing that you put in your mouth, there's a 20, a 20, 20%, like it's a massive fudge factor. <laughs> Imagine that. I'm going to go for a 5K run. I'll just round it up or down by 20%. We wouldn't do that. You know, there's no. a big difference between running 6Ks and 5Ks for most of us. <laughs> ah, if you're getting paid by your boss each week and he goes, ah, oh, plus or minus 20%. <laughs> like you, you just go, oh, no, thanks. I'll just have the exact amount. That's oh, right. you know, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, 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 it, it's ridiculous. So that's the first thing to note that the labelling isn't accurate. Mm, mm. The second thing um, that I think we should chat about is the, the accuracy of Ant Water's mm. calorie calorie mm. definitions, mm. And, all based on averages. Mm. Yeah, so and talk there is to us no about average that. food. Yeah, mm. there's no average food, and there's no average human. So it's based on you know averages of the percentages of the food, but it it doesn't take into account all of these, all of the aspects that determine how much energy we can actually get from the food that we eat. And that depends on whether it's been cooked or not cooked, whether mm. it's been ground or not ground. Um, and the thermogenic effect, we've talked about this before of some foods. So some foods just, it takes us more energy to be able to absorb them. So the net energy that you get is less because it took more energy to get the energy out of food and things like uh, foods that are higher in fibre, foods that are higher in protein have got more of a thermogenic effect. Mm. So it, it really varies. Um, there is no average, there is no average uh, person, no average food. And we know that whole foods, unprocessed foods, generally have got less calories available to us than ultra processed foods. Mm. Um, on average, but even the variation within whole foods, there's a pretty significant difference between what well, you were saying before, it's like a ripe mm. tomato versus an unripe tomato. Different yeah. variations of tomatoes have all going to have different amounts of calories that are available for us to consume. And then there's differences. Do you know like people in Russia often have got longer intestines than other than, than people in other parts of the world? And mm. that affects how much energy they can get from their food different gut microbiome. So in particular, you know, the Japanese people are known to have quite different, on average, uh, gut microbiomes than people from Australia, than people from America. And this changes how much calories and energy they could get from their food. So it's all really, really, it, it's a very flawed system for measuring things. And oh. yet we are married to it. <laughs> married. I married know. to Where calories. <laughs> And, you know, I, I look and think, okay, uh, and, and, and protein powders, you know, extremely popular. Um, and what we know is that you can absorb. So I think, I think that protein powders are ex extremely useful if you're <laughs> underweight. If you're underweight, they're really helpful because you can absorb your protein really easily. If you're an Olympic bodybuilder or, or whatever, if you're just wanting to build muscle and you don't you don't have any metabolic issues, you're not trying to lose weight, then then probably protein powder supplementation can be helpful. Mm. But what's happened is that protein powders have been sold, if you like, as a weight loss solution when what we want, so I, I like to imagine that your your body, you know, to absorb the 
protein from, let's say, you know, a piece of chicken, it has to eat the chicken. So it has to, first of all, it often has to prepare it. So that in itself means that your body is moving and you're, <laughs> um, you know, using, you need to use fuel to do that. You're then sitting down, you're using potentially a knife and fork and you are chewing. Again, chewing creates enzymes. We've got to make those from scratch. We've got to, you know, chew, that's a muscle action. We've got to swallow more muscle actions. Again, all of these require energy. It goes into our stomach. As we're in the stomach, then all more proteins are made. Uh, enzymes are made to cleave these gigantic proteins down to smaller proteins and polypeptides and then finally amino acids. And again, our body has to make all of that from scratch. And that requires energy. And that's okay because you are you don't even know you're doing it. Like how clever is our body? We're just sitting there and it's mm. making all this stuff. So we can do all of that. And then as we're doing all of that, that creates some heat and, again, increases our metabolic rate. So all of that's happening. And yet that is given the same caloric value as ingesting a protein powder for which you don't need to do any chewing. It's already been cleaved. There's no enzymes being made. You barely need to swallow it. You just open your mouth and zip it, in it goes. Mm-hmm. And that's before we, we even talk about the insulin effect of both of those two different things. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And so this is why calorie counting is so flawed. But the thing that gets on my goat so much is that there are people and influential people, particularly trainers, but not necessarily trainers, I recently was at a thing with another health professional and she made this great proclamation that the only way to lose weight is, you know, in fact, it was the proclamation was, well, we all know that the only way to lose weight is to be in a calorie deficit. I felt like putting up my hand going, oh, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't all know that <laughs> right. because it's not true, but it wasn't quite the right forum. So... <laughs> It's really, really important, I think, that we keep banging this drum because the rhetoric that you can add up your calories and minus the ones that you use at the end of the day and somehow you will magically be thin by doing this is just rubbish. Yeah, and let's unpack that a little bit more. So why is calorie counting harmful and why is chasing a calorie deficit counterproductive? Well, it's it's harmful because it's wrong and people, companies, you know, Weight Watchers built an empire on various versions of calorie counting, whether it was points, portions, all of those things. Influence. These influencers are doing the same thing there. Mm. So it's, it's harmful for that reason. But the ultimate harm, the long-term harm, is that if you follow this logic, several things will happen. One, you may well initially lose some body fat. And that's, that's the thing I think that is, again, it's like, It's like gambling. You might put a bet on and you may well win the first time. And so you kind of get hooked into this thinking, oh, that must work. Um, I'll keep going with this. But but ultimately what happens is our body is clever and it it goes, if it can't access its stored fuel, it goes, right, well, what am I going to do? Because we've already decided you can't actually be in an energy deficit unless you're dead. So it's not going to let you do that. It is going to therefore slow down the things that it's doing, the things that it does while you're asleep, growing hair, replacing cells, making eyelashes, all those (laughs) things that you don't even think about. Beating your heart won't stop that. Um, Mm. But it will slow everything down. Which is yuck Mm. and and not trivial at all, That, that slowing down of your metabolic processes to match the reduced energy intake Mm. is not at all trivial. Like people feel cold, people feel tired, people can have a low mood, dry skin, brittle hair, like it's, it's not good. And the other thing is it can take a while to repair. Mm. And yes, I, I, I do believe the science and my experience shows that it can repair mm-hmm. for most people. It absolutely can. Um, 
but it's it's not at all trivial. It's I think it's quite dangerous to our health and well being. So you've got some fat stores that you would like to be able to burn. Um, you'd like to be able to use your fat stores for energy, perhaps for health. Perhaps you want to get rid of the dangerous, inflamed, sort of visceral fat around your tummy. Perhaps you mm. want to lose weight for other reasons. What is like a a healthy, helpful, and good way to be able to access your fat stores? Well. I mean, the number one thing we need to do, again, is make sure insulin is low. Nothing will happen while your insulin levels are high. It locks that woodshed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't get into your fuel tanker. You can't get into your woodshed. You literally cannot get your stored body fat while insulin is high. So that's that has to be the first step. And so, you know, I think I would love a phrase, rather than low calorie, why don't we talk about low insulin? foods or low insulin Mm. recipes like that would be a far more useful term than low calorie recipes Mm. because you can have a low calorie recipe that's still very high in carbohydrate that will cause your insulin levels to remain high and so you've then got basically this you're eating low energy food that keeps your woodshed locked and so all that is going to result on in is you being hungry Mm. Because that's that's hunger is a sign for the body that it ha- it, it needs some fuel. That's right. A hundred grams of diet chocolate mousse is not going to have the same effect on your body as a hundred grams of, you know, salmon. No, <laughs> and even a hundred, you know, a hundred calories. Yeah, yeah, yeah hundred <laughs> calories. Or and we know this because this is why people who drink, you know, sugary soft drinks, for example, which is the fastest way to get glucose into the body. It's no pro, you know, you don't need to break it down. It's already broken down. It's easy to ingestion. It's no, you know, you don't need swallowing. And it gives you a massive insulin load and then the energy is all absorbed and then bang, you're hungry again. Hmm. So one of the things that I think calorie counting neglects is the idea that food, the, the components of food, different components of food will keep you hungry or or not. So we want to have foods that keep us full for long periods of time. And, I mean, it's so amazing to me because we have people who have, who do our programs and they have, you know, done the the dietary guidelines, three meals, three snacks. They've always had Mm. breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea and dinner. Some of them will have supper, but again, not everybody. So again, five to six times a day. They have never gone four hours without eating. Mm. And to do so feels so scary for them mm. Mm. until they lower their insulin, you know, eat foods that will keep you full and mosey about their day amazed. We get so many people saying that they are amazed that the hunger just isn't there gnawing at them all the time by eating foods that are really satisfying, that nourish you and yeah, and keep you full. It's wonderful. I, remember, I was amazed the first time it ah. happened to me. Just, yeah, walking past the ice cream aisle in the free, in the supermarket, I'm like, I don't, I don't want ice cream. This is unprecedented ever since well, I knew what ice cream was. <laughs> back to my, um, you know, health professional that I, I uh, didn't call out in this forum who was saying that the only way to lose weight is to be in a calorie deficit. She also said that that will result in you being hungry mm, and no. that that's, that means it's working. Oh, uh, no. Which is so dangerous because, honestly, the thing with hunger, hunger is physiological. Mm. And it's not a character flaw. If you, It's not a character flaw and you can try and white-knuckle your way through it but eventually hunger will trump willpower. Mm. Hunger wins. So if you're walking past that ice cream aisle and you are, your body is saying, I need fuel, lady, I need fuel, How can get me some fuel, and you're going, no, 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 it's going to look at that ice cream and go, well, that's pretty quick energy. Mm. Why don't we get that? And your brain's going, no, I'm not doing that. I'm being good. No, no, no. If you're full, it's not going to keep reminding you that it needs fuel. It's not going to keep saying to you, what about this, what about this? It's going to go, I'm full, God. I'm full. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Let's keep moseying by. And that mental chatter, it's just quiet. Yeah, it's much so quieter. That's much quieter. So that's the, the first thing is that, yes, heal your metabolism, eat satiating foods, get your insulin under control, 
and then things are much quieter and then what would be the next layer? Well, then I guess, you know, again, we're thinking, we've, we're wanting to, to burn, uh, use, in fact, use is an easiest word, use, use our yeah. body fat. No, that's what we want to do. That's what lots of people want to do. So therefore we go, all right, well, now we've now got access to it. And now the things are over time, and again, lots of us have done 30 or 40 years of, of, you know, trying to count calories and we've developed various mindsets and we've got various cultural things. Mm -hmm. And so it's often unlearning some of those stories. And I thought we should talk about that next week as well. And we did, we mentioned it um, last week in our mindset episode, but next week I thought we'd also talk about motivation. But understanding how your body works and tuning in, again, we have never done that, tuning into your hunger, tuning into your satiety, not eating just because it's morning tea time, not eating just because it's lunchtime, actually eating when you're hungry. Yes. And I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how much food, how much better food tastes when you're a little bit hungry. Yeah. Not overwhelmingly hungry where you could almost eat your arm off, but just that little bit. Which, you know, again, it's working up an appetite. People used to use that phrase all the time and now we mm. don't. Mm. Love it. Mm. So gorgeous ones, don't stress too much about calories. It's much more about food quality mm. than quantity. Yes. And if you can choose what you eat and when you eat and then your body with its natural, normal hunger signals, ultimately will decide how much you eat. Yes. And if you're following a fitness influencer who starts showing you a video of a bucket of water and telling you that all you need to do is put less into the bucket than you pour out, then run. The red flag, they don't yep. know what they're talking about. They've simplified it down to basic, basic language that's wrong. If I, I, it will be the hill that I die on, honestly, this just calling out, <laughs> uh, calling out fitness uh, trainers, it's particularly trainers, but as I mentioned, not necessarily trainers, but anybody, anyone who even uses the phrase calorie deficit, unless you're talking about a dead person, is wrong. <laughs> Your poor goats, Lucy. They're still getting I know. Them. I know. I'm on my goat. I am getting on my goat. I'm on my horse, my high horse with my goat. Protecting your goats. Yep. <laughs> well, I think you're the goat, Lucy. <laughs> oh. uh. <laughs> what a lovely segue to finish. <laughs> All right, gorgeous listeners, thank you so much for joining us again today. And hopefully we have helped you just uncouple yourself from calorie counting uh, and recognize that it is not as simple as calories in, calories out. Weight loss is chemistry, not maths. It's hormones, not calories. <laughs> Absolutely. See you later, gorgeous one. Bye for now. The information shared on the Real Health and Weight Loss podcast, including show notes and links, provides general information only. It is not a substitute nor is it intended to provide individualized medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, nor can it be construed as such. Please consult your doctor for any medical concerns. <music>